Hello, welcome to the New Criterion podcast. I'm James Panero, executive editor of the New Criterion, and I'm here today with Stephen Sims. And this is exciting for me because uh, it is our first video Skype podcast. So thank you, Stephen, for being uh, the guinea pig on this experiment. We'll see how it goes. And now Stephen is the Associate Professor of Architecture and Director of the Graduate Program in Historical Preservation at the Notre Dame School of Architecture. And you're also the author of a fantastic book, which I have right here, and I'll get it on the Skype screen. So, yeah, it's The Future of the Past. Is it in there? Good. A, a Conservation Ethic for Architecture, Urbanism, and Historic Preservation. And I have to say the cover speaks <laughs> volumes here. What are we looking at? What we're looking at is Soldier Field in Chicago, which uh, in about 2005 or so uh, had this addition uh, where they vastly increased the seating of the stadium by having what appears to be the mother ship uh, hovering over the classical peristyles of the 1920s original stadium. It's a great, it's a great example. It reminds me of the movie Independence Day, if you remember. I, I do. I, I do remember that, and, it, and I thought about it. Uh, maybe we're, uh, we're dating ourselves with that uh, reference. <laughs> uh, but um, now Stephen and I uh, both just came back from a very interesting conference in Chicago um, sponsored by the Driehaus Foundation called the Chicago Tradition and Architecture, Inspiration or Artifact. And mm. here is the, um, the materials for that. And um, at, at this conference, uh, you am were among other panelists, and you gave a, a fascinating talk on distinguishing architecture between an architecture of time and an architecture of place. And right. um, this uh, idea, I think, will become... Um, uh, part of the thesis of an article you're working on for us for our December issue. Right, right. So what is this distinction? Well, what's interesting is that it's a relatively recent phenomenon in human history. Um, uh, for the most part, up until, let's say, the 1920s and 30s or so, most architects or most people who were interested in architecture, people who were interested in cities, assumed that new buildings would be built alongside old buildings. And while the new buildings might be in a new style, they might use new materials, new technologies, somehow or other, the expectation was that all of these buildings would eventually fit together and make a city that had a kind of consistent identity throughout. So we think of all the cities we love, Rome, Paris, London, New York, Philadelphia, San Francisco, wherever. Um, we see them today and we, we see the inheritance of that history of buildings built at various centuries and various materials, various styles, cheek by jowl, and we walk down the street and we think, great, the city has an identity as a whole, not just one building at a time. And what seemed to happen in the 1920s with the rise of the modern movement in architecture was the idea that suddenly all the rules had changed, that society had changed, that human nature had changed, and therefore the buildings had to change. And so instead of building new buildings that more or less fit together with the old buildings, the idea was now that new buildings should stand in opposition to old buildings. Mm -hmm. And so in 1921-22, you have Mies van der Rohe uh, proposing a glass skyscraper for Berlin, for example, which was, uh, as they say, ahead of its time because it took some decades for that to be realized. And of course, now we have glass skyscrapers cheek by jowl with masonry older buildings everywhere. But it started at that point. And the, the attitude was that historical architecture and, and contemporary architecture, instead of being partners in making the city, were now antagonists. And so what I've been interested in is trying to find out how do we make them partners again? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is different from, an, so what is the architecture of time? Is that an architecture of the zeitgeist? Exactly. I, uh, in the talk I gave, uh, which was called Where or When? Uh, Continuity and Contrast in uh, Historic Settings, sort of picking up from the old Broadway song, Where or When? I can't remember where or when. But in this case, really making a distinction between an architecture of where and an architecture of when. The time-based architecture, which is something that sort of crept up on us toward the end of the 19th century, 
uh, was this idea that it was terribly important, not only in architecture, but in many of the arts, to express something distinctive about our time, mm -hmm. as if our time were different from any previous time. I suppose in 1450, if you'd interviewed, you know, Alberti and Brunelleschi, they would have said, yes, we're moving into a new time. You know, the barbarian, you know, sort of Gothic architecture is over. We're doing something new. Someday, 200 years from now, you'll call what we're doing today the Renaissance. <laughs> and, you know, and you'll look back on it and you say, yes, they changed the game. Uh, something similar happened in the 1920s when everybody said, you know, what's most important is that we express the imperatives of our own age. Naturally, this comes from the philosophy of Hegel and then further elaborated by Marx. The idea that history has a program, that history is moving towards some kind of a result. Uh, the Whig view of history, as it's called in uh, another wonderful book. Uh, all this should be familiar to people who are interested in historiography and the philosophy of history. Of course, we all know that since 1989, at least, um, this idea that history is moving towards some specific endpoint has been called into question. It seems like maybe nothing is inevitable after all. Well, if nothing is inevitable after all, then we're free to choose what is the end toward which we're working. We don't have to imagine that the zeitgeist is like the weather, something that just sort of sweeps us along and we can't do anything about. So we can decide what we want the future to look like. It's not a given. And of course, architecture is not just a philosophy. We were left with very permanent buildings. Yes. And so the result of uh, uh, this time-based approach, one of them we see, for example, in the way expansions are put onto museums. This is a topic right. inter interesting to me in particular, uh, that if you're expanding a museum, let's say the Harvard Art Museum, or let's right. say the Morgan Library here in New York, um, sure. It, it, or 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 the Frick, let's say, uh, frick. which was done on, in many phases. In fact, yes. um, in the Frick example, in the past, you had different, somewhat different styles go in at different times, but it creates a harmonious whole that I don't think anyone would be able, who wasn't an architect, to pick apart what was what. In the case of contemporary expansions, let's say piano at the Morgan Library, it's it, it, the the point of the architecture is to make a distinction. Uh, between the historical and the new. And the new stands, as you say, in opposition to the old. That's right. So why is that? Why is there this need, um, even hostility, as I see it, to the past and the need to assert the present? Well, of course, that's a very difficult question to answer simply. Obviously, that has a lot to do with cultural trends that have been going on for at least a century. Uh, so we would have to ask ourselves, why is it that architects especially, probably more than any other discipline, I think, you know, this exists in other art forms. You know, people in the academic field of music might have similar ideas about what music today should be and how it should be different from music of previous times. But to my knowledge, there is no other discipline where this has had such a, uh, such a determined effect on contemporary production as in architecture. Architects seem absolutely convinced that as we move forward in time, we must invent a new architecture every decade or so. Uh, and that was another one of the points of my talk. The time-based view of architecture says that 2015 has to look different than 1915, which has to look different from 1815 or 15 <laughs> BC, let's say. Um, and that any building that sort of resembled something that we've seen before is in some way out of time. It's anachronistic. And worse than that, it's seen as, frankly, not being architecture. So if you were to design an addition to a Georgian revival museum, which might have been started out with an actual Georgian late 18th century building, had a 19th uh, or 20th century Georgian revival edition, and then you came along in the 1960s or in 2015 and you added another wing in the same style, you would be denounced as creating false history. The underlying assumption of that being that history has this kind of program and you have to be with that program. It's very convenient for the people who are kind of the stars of the architectural avant-garde from a marketing point of view. Because if you can say, I am riding the crest of history, 
then that's a great marketing strategy for your firm. <laughs> Renzo Piano, for example, in answering the question, you know, well, what do you say to people who were opposed to your skyscraper in Torino in Italy, announced, well, I would say they're afraid of the future. Now, that's a wonderful marketing strategy if you can say that my designs in the future are, by definition, the same thing. And so yeah. <laughs> it's hard to argue with that unless you just say, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure I go along with this idea that history leads inevitably to your work. <laughs> now, what's interesting to me is that, you know, we had uh, coming out of the 1950s and 60s, we had in the late 60s and 70s, a, a preservationist movement, a, uh, you know, a turn back to 19th century forms. And then into the 1980s, uh, uh, postmodernism. Um, yeah. One of the talks we heard at the Driehaus uh, Symposium was... Um, uh, Thomas Beebe discussing the uh, the Harold Washington Library, which is right. from 1991, I believe, uh, in Chicago, and uh, certainly drawing on many older forms in Chicago uh, uh, into what might be considered a postmodern building. I'm not sure he would consider it one. Um, and you mentioned also the kind of the sense that there is not a historical determinism with the fall of communism, and then and right. kind of played into that time frame. Yet. Sure. T today, it, it seems to me that those modes of thinking are out again and a new determinism is in so that you get these buildings like the piano buildings um, that relate to nothing but themselves and or Gary and, and internationally all look kind of the same to each other, right? but don't relate to anything in particular, no, certainly not to place. So what, right. ha what happened to the whole ethic of preservation and, and, a, and the revival of older forms? Well, one possible way of thinking about that is that the people who are very into being with the zeitgeist have a very selective idea about what the zeitgeist might be. Instead of saying, well, the zeitgeist, it's certainly in, in most historiographic sources, let's say, is something that is only knowable retrospectively. You could look back on the 18th century and say, well, it appears that this was a dominant theme of what people were thinking and doing. What gets a little bit dicey is when you say, I know what it is now, and I know where it's going next. And it's me. And it's me. <laughs> or it's not you. <laughs> That's also important, is to say who it's not, right? Not right. So the idea that the zeitgeist becomes a kind of qualification, you know, if you're with me, you're with the zeitgeist. So Renzo Piano and half a dozen other architects that we could name sort of constitute this sort of committee that decides who's qualified to bear the zeitgeist and who isn't. Now, if you think about the zeitgeist actually having some relationship to what actually happens, as opposed to some kind of theoretical idea, you would have to say, well, historic preservation was part of the zeitgeist, that postmodernism was part of the zeitgeist, that resistance to the architectural avant-garde is also part of the zeitgeist. I kind of think, I'm kind of agnostic on the question of whether there is a zeitgeist, but I kind of feel like if there is one, it's probably contradictory. Mm -hmm. Because sort of in a Newtonian sense, for any kind of action, you see kind of an equal and opposite reaction. So we have, in the present day, we have an avant-garde architecture that is all about making things that are totally unprecedented, that we've never seen before. We also have, I would say, the majority of architects and the majority of uh, clients for architecture preferring an architecture that actually does look like something we've seen before and that can create a city where new buildings can join old buildings, not imitating them precisely, but to join with them in a way that creates something coherent. So... If you have both of these things happening at the same time, then our zeitgeist is plural. And so my, my whole point, and something I tried to bring out in my talk, is I'm not opposed to any style of architecture. I'm not saying that we shouldn't build buildings that look a certain way. I'm opposed to other people who say we shouldn't build buildings that look a certain way, which happen to be the way my, I might prefer them to look. Mm -hmm. So if we have a zeitgeist that has more than one choice, then we don't really have a zeitgeist that determines anything. And uh, that is a kind of freedom that we need to, we need to grab onto.
Yeah, what, and what you say about this, uh, using the language of the zeitgeist, you know, it reminds me of uh, what Hilton Kramer, the founder of New Criterion, wrote yeah, even before he founded New Criterion. Uh, this is back in the 1970s in his most famous essay, The Age of the Avant-Garde, making mm. the argument that the language of the avant-garde becomes the marketing strategy of the commercial class. I will have to go back and attribute some of that to Hilton. I've always admired his writing, and I think he had his finger on it. Uh, the I tried to make a, a allude to this in my talk that after the Berlin Wall, the zeitgeist was no longer determined or defined by, let's call it, a progressive social agenda. The idea that the zeitgeist was about, you know, liberating the working class or what have you. At a certain point, it became clear that now the zeitgeist is about whatever sells products. Mm -hmm. And architecture has become a product. And so if you are, you know, the head of Prada and you're hiring an architect, you want to hire somebody who's going to have sort of a Prada sensibility, right? Because you don't want to build an Armani building if you're Prada. Well, I think it's the same, you know, in architecture generally. Now that the zeitgeist is pretty much being defined by the marketing departments of six firms in the world, uh, we uh, to be told that somebody who wants to do something different, somebody who wants to put... God help us, a Corinthian column on their building is suddenly, you know, out of contention for being considered architecture because they're not doing what the six leading firms are marketing. This is the situation we're in now. And so the way to break out of it, I suggested my talk, is let's forget about time altogether. Let's focus on place because place is something we can all understand. And place isn't being defined for us by other people. Places are supported by communities. And so if you're, if the place is, let's say, Bryant Park in New York, a very familiar place that's extremely successful and not really contested, it's not something that is defined by an elite, something that every New Yorker, no matter who you are, can enter and use and enjoy, there's a place. Now, what kind of architecture, both within and around Bryant Park, supports that and what might be less supportive of that? That then becomes the question, mm -hmm. right? So it's not it's not a question of well, what is the dominant form, and then slavishly following that form of a place. It's more of a holistic or a humanistic question. It sounds like I would say it has a lot to do with what in architecture we used a word we used to use a lot, stopped using for a long time, and I've been trying to get back, and that's the word character. A place has character. You know, in ancient times, in, in, say, ancient Rome, they had this idea of genius loci, a Latin term meaning the spirit of a place. Now, being polytheists, the Romans took that literally. They thought that there really was a spirit who, you know, guarded that bridge or that forest or that village or whatever, any place. And you would have to make a little sacrifice to that spirit to make sure you cross the bridge safely and so on. Well, we're not polytheists most of us nowadays, but I think the idea that places have individual identities is still very strong, which is why people pay millions and millions of dollars every year to visit places that do have character. Um, you know, um, there are lots of nice towns in America, but, you know, without, without offending anyone, I hope, you know, millions of people don't flock to, you know, suburban Houston or suburban New Jersey to see it. But people who live in those places will do whatever they can to go to Venice or Paris for a week or Rome or wherever you like, because they want to see a place that has that kind of character. And that, that kind of character isn't something you create overnight. You don't, you, know, you don't have a team of architects sit down and say, OK, we're going to build a place out in the middle of nowhere and it's going to have this great character. Character something's conferred on a place as it is on a person by life experience. And so all the places we love most, New York, Paris, take your pick, have character because they have lived a long time and had really interesting lives, and architecturally as well as historically. So what's going to, talking about city character, uh, you know, one concern of yours I, I, I remember you talking about is what's happening in Paris right now with infill. So yeah. what is infill? You know, what specifically is happening there? Well, infill is just the ongoing process of filling gaps in a city or 
a building is no longer can no longer support itself it's taken down and a new building replaces it this is this is something that's natural in the life of every city i mean i uh, i want to make it clear that i'm not one of those people in preservation i think actually there are very few uh, who think that the goal of preservation is to arrest change i think most preservations would agree that it's about managing the kind of change that a city undergoes especially one that is loved um, if you have a city that everybody, the whole world recognizes the most beautiful, let's say Paris, uh, then the kind of changes that you introduce become an issue. Uh, nobody thinks that Paris should not have new buildings. But the question becomes, what kind of new buildings would be appropriate in Paris? I suggested that the appropriate is something that is both fitting and exemplary, meaning that it takes its place alongside what's already there without sort of fighting against it. And it's exemplary in the sense that it sets an example for what might come later. So the idea of building a triangular, you know, a high-rise tower, uh, uh, you know, whose surfaces are all mostly glass, um, doesn't seem to be an appropriate thing to add to Paris. If you think of a city as being like an art collection or an ecosystem, maybe is even a better example, the things that you introduce into it are terribly important. Let's say you have an art collection of Dutch masters and you decide to add an Andy Warhol to it. Now, without making a judgment as to whether we like Andy Warhol or not, it probably, most people would probably think it doesn't fit in with a collection of Dutch masters. Uh, if you have an ecosystem of rainforest, then, you know, planting cactus probably isn't, you know, the best thing. So if we think about cities that way as things to be curated that grow and change, but in particular ways, then we could ask what kinds of buildings should be added to Paris. Well, maybe Paris should have new Parisian buildings added. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, new York is a little more difficult because there are more different kinds of buildings that we associate with New York. I don't think anybody would say there shouldn't be skyscrapers in New York. But we could certainly ask what kind of skyscrapers. Um, you know, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler are very different from the latest generation of these sort of pencil-thin glass uh, containers, which are a very different kind of thing. So that's really the question I would ask about cities. That's a good point. You bring up those um, the Billionaires Row, the developments of 57th Street, which yeah. is only in the middle of its construction phase right now and will radically transform the New York skyline uh, with these pencil buildings. Uh, they're, I think, they're vastly unpopular. I can't think of mostly anybody who likes them. Uh, but as you say, it is not really talked about or it's right. It, retrospectively, we can complain about it, but there's no kind of uh, holistic thinking about, well, what's the kind of what is the city we want it to? How do we want it to look? Now, one question I have, we we're in Chicago for this wonderful Driehaus Symposium and the suppose, symposium itself was occasioned uh, by Chicago's first architecture biennial. Uh, which was taking place throughout the city, and um, and the, and the Dree House people decided to have the symposium time to that. Did you take a look at the biennial? I didn't really have a chance to uh, to view the exhibitions, but uh, uh, but uh, the the uh, I am familiar with some of the people participating in them. I don't really want to express a judgment on the work of different people who you know obviously there are varying levels of interest and quality and so on. But what I did find interesting was the, um, uh, the uh, some of the commentary I read that, that sort of identified the, 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 the Driehaus Symposium as being kind of an exception to the culture of the biennial in an interesting way. Um, and, and sort of being seen as, uh, I think the term Stanley Tigerman used was retrograde. And so I've, I was sort of amused by that because it's interesting that if you raise questions about contemporary architecture, you might be branded as retrograde, um, which I guess is a little bit better than being branded reactionary, which I've also been called. And I find that amusing because I, uh, I had a wonderful set of uh, sort of point counterpoint appearances with the late Paul Bayard, who was a wonderful man in New York who wrote a book called The Architecture of Additions, which took a very different approach to architecture than I have. And, um, before we met, uh, I had written a, a review of his book, which was very critical, but not in any way personal, let's say. And uh, he wrote a letter to the editor saying, I don't know who this Sems character is, but he's obviously react politically reactionary and probably a follower of the Taliban. Uh, 
Well, I wrote back to the editor, whom I knew, because the editor shared that letter with me. I said, well, that's very funny, because I know something about Paul Byard, and I think probably demographically and politically, we're very similar. As I said, my, my belief is we probably agree about everything except what buildings should look like. And it turns out that was the case. When we finally met, we agreed. We had very different ideas about architectural style, but we agreed on basically everything else. So I don't know where the idea that asking questions is retrograde comes from, but maybe, <laughs> maybe Stanley can tell us. I do want to credit a couple of people who are helping to move this forward. I mean, there has been a, a very courageous attempt in Paris, for example, and American Friends of Paris. I think, James, you met Mary Campbell Gallagher at the symposium. Um, she has been uh, sort of galvanizing in a movement of American Friends of Paris. There's an international outcry against the policies of the mayor, Anne Hidalgo, uh, who wants to reinvent Paris. And Friends of Paris are saying, no, you don't need to reinvent Paris. Paris is already perfect. Uh, New York may not be perfect, but I don't think New York needs to be reinvented either. Let's just let New York be New York. That would be my <laughs> my two cents. That's great. Yes. Well, you know, um, I'm really looking forward to your article in our December issue. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And once again, uh, my guest is Stephen Sims. Uh, and uh, his book, one more time, is The Future of the Past, a terrific book from Norton. Here it is again. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, James. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.